Good afternoon to President Hamilton, Dean Furholden, to the faculty, the students, and families and friends of our graduates. I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to speak with you today and thank Dean Furholden for the invitation. I've listened to many graduation speeches as a student myself, as a faculty member, as a dean, and now as president. And the most memorable speeches have one thing in common. They're all brief <laughs> and to the point. And since I'd like my speech to be remembered by a few of you, I'm going to keep my comments as short as possible today. But that's kind of challenging for me because I'm a Baptist and it takes us three minutes just to clear our throats. So, <laughs> so bear with me. I asked Dean Furholden if there were any topics that I could touch on that might be of particular interest to the graduates today. And she said there were none, but she told me that you all are determined to make a difference in the world. And I must say I'm encouraged to hear that that is the case because that's what we need you all to do. So class of 2023, you've experienced a unique educational uh, experience, having been trained during a pandemic. And you had to make the difficult shift from in-person learning to virtual for most of you. And while virtual pedagogy is efficient and convenient, it's a terrible way to learn, at least for some of us. But I hope that getting your degree in public health during a pandemic has affirmed your career choice and made you even more excited about getting out into the world and improving the health of communities. The statistics around COVID-19 pandemic show it to be the most significant global crisis since World War II. According to the WHO, more than 765 million cases of COVID-19 were reported and almost 7 million people died as a result of SARS-CoV-2. These are truly staggering numbers. The pandemic also took a significant toll here in the United States. More than 103 cases diagnosed and more than a million people died because of COVID-19. A striking feature of the pandemic in our country was the wide chasm of the burden of disease and death among minorities in our country. As a matter of fact, if you were black, Hispanic, or an indigenous person, you had a much, much higher risk of getting COVID-19 and dying from it than a white population. Thankfully, COVID-19 is receding into the rearview mirrors. And as a matter of fact, over the last several days, the WHO director and President Biden declared that COVID-19 is no longer a health emergency. But while it's not a health emergency, it's still a threat to many of us, especially those who have underlying conditions and who are immunocompromised. The pandemic had a significant impact on the global communities and virtually shut down many industries for the first time in recent memory. I was struck by reports from India that there were people living in communities that had never seen the clear blue sky before until COVID-19 shut down factories, parked cars and airplanes, and the skies cleared for the first time. This is a dramatic demonstration, if we needed one, that human activities are definitely having an effect on climate and driving climate change. There are several other important takeaways from the pandemic I'd like to share with you that might inform us and in how we might prepare for the next global crisis. First of all, COVID-19 demonstrated in a very dramatic way the interconnectedness of the 7.5 billion humans that occupy this planet. That was responsible for the rapid spread of SARS-CoV-2, but also responsible for the rapid spread of myths and disinformation that proved a challenge for health care, health, public health professionals. The pandemic also revealed for many folks, not for others, <laughs> the wide gap and disparities in healthcare infrastructure and healthcare resources between low-income countries and high-income countries. As a matter of fact, when the United States had vaccinated 80% of the population here, there were countries in Africa and other places that still had not reached 10% vaccination for the populations in those places. The pandemic also highlighted the dangers of American exceptionalism. Scientists and public health professionals made many discoveries that led to life-saving recommendations in those places. And based, for example, let me give you one example. Based on work done in Europe and other places, SARS-CoV-2 was declared a airborne pathogen much sooner in other parts of the world than it was here. 
Why is that important? Because recognizing it as an airborne pathogen allowed us to take steps that save thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of lives. So achieving the best health here in America could be accelerated by a bit of what I call cultural humility, recognizing that we as a country can learn some very important things from our global neighbors. The pandemic also put the awesome power of biomedical research on full display. The rapid development of effective COVID-19 vaccines was possible because of decades of fundamental research and translating those research findings into drugs and vaccines. I suggest to you, as a basic scientist, that basic science saved the world. The scientists who discovered messenger RNA in the 1960s, for which they won a Nobel Prize, could scarcely have imagined that their discovery would save the world from a pandemic 60 years later. The awesome power of science is, that I refer to has made possible something that we thought was a pipe dream just a few years ago. That is true precision medicine in which vast amounts of data subjected to machine learning and artificial intelligence can create treatment plans uniquely suited for each and every patient. These large data sets are continually growing through various omics in which every molecule of a certain type can be measured and quantified in a single cell or in tissues. Proteomics for proteins, glycomics for carbohydrates, lipidomics for lipids, transcriptomics for RNA, and of course, genomics for DNA. Unfortunately, precision medicine and omics have not translated into improvements of the overall health of the U.S. population, and it's not likely to do so anytime soon. Sorry. This is true despite the, spec, despite the fact that the U.S. spends more than $4 trillion on health care, which would be more, more appropriately referred to as sick care. I suggest that we need to focus on a different omics to achieve the goal of improving our health. I call it equitomics. Equitomics is when we take the existing medicines and approaches to preventive medicine that lead to reductions in high blood pressure, cancer, and other things, and make those available to the whole population. This is how we improve the health of everyone, and this is how we reduce that $4 trillion price tag. This does not require sequencing another protein or developing any more biased algorithms. What it requires is that we declare healthcare and health to be a basic human right and make sure that every person in the world has access to it. This is how we as a nation, <laughs> this is how we as a nation reduce the $4 trillion price tag we pay for treating sick people and finally, finally, finally rank among the healthiest nations in the world. Right now, despite spending more than any other country on the, on the globe for health care, we don't rank among the 10 healthiest nations in the world based on some metrics. As you heard from my introduction, I've been deeply involved in the fight against COVID-19, both at the local level in Nashville, but also as a national level, serving on the FDA vaccine and drug advisory committees on President Biden's Health Equity Task Force. Our charge as members of the President's Task Force was to make recommendations to the President on how best to close the chasm in the health status of Americans that was revealed by COVID-19. The final report to the President, if you're interested, from the task force is available on the HHS website, and there are more than 200 recommendations we made to the President about how to improve the health. And we had four major areas we focused on, data analytics and research, structural drivers and xenophobia, healthcare quality and access, and communications and collaborations. A major recommendation of our task force is, in fact, that health care be declared a human right and that access to quality health care be available to all Americans. We concluded our recommendations by summarizing the impact it would have if they were implemented. And I'll just go through these very briefly. There are four of them. First, community expertise and effective communication will be elevated in health care and public health. Two, health equity will be centered in all processes, practices, and policies. What we mean by that is that every level of government, local, state, and federal, 
whenever a decision is being made that impacts health, the special consideration will be given for the different needs, cultures, and expectations of minoritized communities. Third was everyone will have equitable access to high quality health care. And number four, data will accurately represent all populations and their experiences to drive equitable decisions. I must point out here that data is most useful when it's disaggregated so that resources can be directed where they're most needed. And that was a really important recommendation. So the challenges facing public health professionals and you as graduates and the threats to a sustainable, healthy future for communities seem very daunting, to be honest with you. Widespread dissemination of myths and disinformation, the politicization of science and public health, underfunding of public health organizations and, and departments, lack of diversity among public health leaders, and COVID-19 related mass burnout and ways of retirement among public health professionals are among a few of these long list of challenges. But consider this quote from Professor Hugh Tilson from the Gilding School of Public Health. And I quote, it's not a dark time for public health, it's our time. It's a time that we've been preparing for since the start of public health, unquote. And consider this from Deloitte's white paper entitled Reimagining the Health, e health Ecosystem. Lingering deficiencies in our public health infrastructure are not due to a lack of collect, are due to a lack of collective purpose and will, not a lack of knowledge. We know the conditions that produce health and wellness, parks and playgrounds, good schools, quality affordable housing, broadband internet access, reliable transportation, and a lack of segregation and violence." Unquote. The present moment offers a unique opportunity to convert the broadening recognition of these deficiencies in action. Graduates, this present moment is your moment. You have the right and might I add the responsibility to seize this moment and work to change this world, your world, to create a healthier future for all of us. You are a fearless generation, but there's yet much to fear, including violence, hate, irrationality, and the subjugation of science to politics. Here in the United States, some have adopted wokeness as a pejorative term to express their contempt toward the idea that all of us, our cultures, our histories, and our contributions should be valid, valued the same. Those who rel against wokeness are a threat to all of us in public health and all that we're tri striving to achieve. So graduates, Gen Zers, Wear your wokeness as a badge of honor. And no matter your race, your religion, your country of origin, your sex defined by what's between your legs, and your gender defined by what's between your ears, don't let any of those things keep you from putting your passion to work for a better world. If you do this, as President Hamilton said, I am confident that the human race is going to be so much better off. You have the right to give yourself permission to do the thing you're most passionate about. So graduates, go get at it. You've got this. And Godspeed on your journeys ahead. Thank you so much.